Thank you all for coming and welcome to the intimate panel on polyamory. I would like to, to start by telling, uh, for those who want to, uh, to be in the activist meeting tomorrow at 3, 3 p.m. Uh, in room 1 in SESH, Center for Social Studies, uh, those who did not uh, uh, sign yet the, the form, please go to Luciana, she's in there, and please sign it, uh, write your name over there so we can, we can count uh, more or less the number of people, of the uh, people that are going to attend it. Okay, it's time now to present the results of the study on LGBTQ uh, polyamory in Portugal, Italy and Spain. Uh, the name of the study is It Takes More Than Two to Tango, Polyamory as a New Form of Conjugality. And the need for this research emerged from the absence of LGBTQ ethical non-monogamies as a research topic in those three countries. Fieldwork was conducted, conducted in the capitals of, the, of, of Portugal, Italy and Spain between April and June 2015. And during this time, each researcher did five biographic interviews with people between 25 and 45 years old who are in more than one relationship with the knowledge of all the people involved. Uh, the objective uh, of these biographic interviews was to provide a critical insight into the issue of polyamory understood as an emerging form of conjugality involving complex negotiations around partnership housing, care, kinship, public rec recognition, and many other topics. Um, researchers also conducted interviews with experts uh, on legal and health uh, issues, decision makers, scholars, or people working in the academia, uh, and activists, <laughs> in order to achieve an insight. <laughs> of the legal, social and political context of poly relationships uh, in each country. We are going to start uh, with Anna Cristina Santos. Uh, his presentation is entitled One at a Time, Relationally, uh, relation, uh, relationally Diverse Patterns Challenging the Monogamous Scripts of Citizenship. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here after such a, a long day, two long days. I'll start straight away because I've got quite a lot to go uh, through. From a legal perspective framework, coupledom is sustained through the expectation of providing care and support based on sexual exclusivity between two cohabiting partners. The Portuguese marriage law identifies uh, five marital duties. Hey, Now you just Facebook or <laughs> do something. The Portuguese marriage um, law identifies five marital duties, respect, fidelity, cohabitation, cooperation and assistance. Therefore, marital duties both result from and actively contribute to the replication of a relational model which is embodied by the cohabiting, reproductive, monogamous and until 2010 heterosexual couple. The tendency to somewhat crystallize the legal and hence legitimate couple is in sharp contrast to an ever-changing reality. Even at a time that has been described as plastic sexuality, in which it is increasingly rare to meet anyone who has only had one sexual or romantic partner throughout their life, monogamy remains the by-default position. 
So, uh, Rambukana was uh, right uh, in one of the opening sentences in his latest book when he said that monogamy is indeed a strange animal. And the strangeness resides in both its resilience and the normalcy ascribed to a behavior which is anything but standard, at least in the statistical sense. So, two aspects um, can immediately be extracted. First, the doing of coupledom is highly performative, needs rituals, as expects openness, relies on allies. This conjures up what I'm suggesting to call relational performativity, which is as expected to be visibly monogamous. And a second aspect is that in a time and space where most adults will have more than one partner throughout their lives, non-monogamy is only acceptable if it remains sequential, that is a consequence of serial monogamy, but cannot be simultaneous. Couples can be multiple as long as they are, are taken one at a time. So, this being the case, what seems to inspire legal guidelines regarding partnering is the time in which relationships occur, rather than the number of people involved or the conditions under which relational diversity operates across the individual lifespan. By failing to ascribe both legal and cultural recognition to non-monogamy, the state betrays some of its most fundamental constitutional principles and pushes relationally diverse people to an uncomfortable situation in which multiple partners are legal se sexual strangers and polyparenting is rendered illegal or illegal. Therefore, we argue, it is important to imagine ways in which it becomes possible to demi... demi... ah... demi... ah... <laughs> normalize citizenship. This is hard. <laughs> Demono... I know, but still... <laughs> Demono normalized citizenship. So this takes us to the next slide. That's the word. Citizenship is a loaded notion. Pushing the notion of citizenship to include intimate, sexual, reproductive citizenship, um, ha well, it has been uh, crucial, but insufficient. Law and social policy around partnering um, and parenting are designed around the imaginary of the monogamous cohabiting couple. As a result, especially in the aftermath of some level of relational recognition for same-sex couples, a significant part of what we could call the good intimate citizen profiling derives from, uh, from mononormative expectations around partnering regardless of sexual orientation. Mononormativity, described as the normalness of monogamy, and institutional monogamy in the resilient ways in which it permeates law, social policy, education, popular culture, um, need to be at the core of concerns about inclusive citizenship practices. Inspired by the challenges and opportunities posed by queering citizenship, the next crucial step is to demononormalize citizenship. <laughs> Yeah, so finding the conditions to be a full intimate citizen comprehends an array of family and relational models, including polyamory. Now, the intimate study on polyamory in Portugal comprehended six in-depth interviews with anonymous participants and also experts. Participants' accounts add vivid empirical layers to the ambition of demononormalizing citizenship, that is, of stripping laws and social policy of its by default monogamous assumptions without formulating, formulating a sharp attack on monogamy. Polyamorous intimate biographies offer new understandings of doing relationships and challenging the heteronormative constraints of mainstream coupledom. Faced with that challenge, we advance the notion of non monogamous relational citizenship to capture both the disjunctions and possibilities for reframing how we perceive, represent, and manage our intimate lives. Relational citizenship highlights the immense diversity in the way we construct our intimate biographies through partnering and friendship. It describes the ways in which we self-perceive and are represented by others as being partnered. It aims at addressing questions of identity and social validation, cultural norms and expectations, opportunities, obstacles that stem from the relational status of each individual. It shows the doing and undoing of coupledom and how the ever-changing experience clashes with laws and social policy, exposing the flaws and inconsistencies and placing networks of friendship and care at the central core of queer relationality. 
In the remaining part of this paper, I want to suggest that we look at non-monogamy and most specifically to polyamory through the metaphor of a border figure. This suggestion will be weaved through the accounts offered by participants in the intimate study uh, in Portugal. Now, border figures, according to Gloria Zaldua, are those who go through the confines of the normal, being in a constant state of transition. I want to suggest that we use the image of the border figure to rethink about the place of the non-monogamous intimate citizen. There are four aspects in which consensual non-monogamy lends itself to be discussed in light of the border figure. First, by being defined mostly by what it is not, non-monogamy both reinforces the symbolic weight of the mononorm and carries the promise of breaking away from it. In multiple ways, the non-monogamous inhabits the border, makes it visible, and confronts us with its existence and subsequent contradictions. Relationally diverse people live and live as and on that border of rejecting marital status, whilst at the same time ambitioning relational, relational recognition. Secondly, by seeking intimate commitment through an ethics of care and consent, non-monogamy and polyamory in particular challenges common ideas that having more than one partner is damaging, selfish, reckless. It seems significant to point out that when asked about legal aspects that should change, the two topics most commonly mentioned by participants were multi-partner parenthood and protection of partners in case of death or disease. Still, this search for commitment is met with mainstream cultural disapproval stemming from a mononormative system which in principle holds commitment as an essential value, but insists in disregarding non-monogamous committed relationships. In my study, it has been reported to be harder to come out of the poly closet than to come out as lesbian or gay to close family members. As such, non-monogamy also inhabits a border constructed along the lines of committed practices and uncommitted representations. It is the ghost of uncommitted relationality that acts as a morally accepted excuse to disregard rights related to poly parenting or relationship status, for instance. Susanna, one of the participants in the study, she said, we don't have any type of rep representation, we're not visible at all, and we don't have any rights. If one of our children ends up in hospital, who gets to be there? Who's got that right to be there? And even in situations of separation or death, right, it's difficult to understand what our rights consist of. Possibly we'll have to swallow many bitter pills or face many unfair situations in which we will not win. And that's sad. I mean, we see it daily. It's always couple-oriented, a short break for two and stuff. These tiny things are a pain because we do not want it to be two of us. We want to be considered as the three of us. This border also becomes visible in moments when people's relational status, sometimes together with sexual orientation, especially bisexuality, is dismissed or not taken very seriously. This was precisely what happened to uh, Paulo, a bisexual man in his late 20s, when he decided to come out to his mother, who told him that everything was fine, that, he, that she accepted it, and therefore he could stop pretending that he also liked women. Or when Susanna, a bisexual woman in her mid-20s, uh, came out of the poly closet to her mom, who was described as already expecting something insane would come, out, would come from her. And later on, that same interview, Susanna adds, um, once Mom and I were chatting, and she said something like, you two, meaning her and her female partner, you two have adopted him as if he is your cat, or something. She thinks, uh, Susanna carries on, she thinks my relationships are a bit like, how should I put this, a product of a whim. For some reason, that is how she sees my relationships, and it's precisely the opposite. So, a third aspect through which we can uh, think of non-monogamy as uh, through the, the, the border figure. Reports about breaking or shifting boundaries or experiencing the feeling of being on the edge of something different or something better, something good, are a significant part of the narratives gathered during the poly study in Portugal. Okay. So, uh, Vera, uh, in her 30s, uh, bisexual. 
The idea of uh, Cinderella and Disney and the love story from the romantic comedy movies and so on, that makes people believe that the most important thing in life is to find a partner, one partner. And relationships are not just one thing, they are highly changeable over time. Narratives of shifting boundaries also include reflections about a new language of intimacy, with the idea of metamour, the partner of one's partner, emerging as an example. We can have relationships which are not described anywhere else. For example, the relationship that we've got with the person who is dating, the person we date. If we do not have a love relationship to that person, then we do, not, then we do have another type of relationship which is not described anywhere. It can be friendship or not. And this uh, was um, a statement by Inês Rolo, who was interviewed as an expert. She's it there. <laughs> there are... <laughs> <laughs> there are also examples um, provided by participants in which they speak about non-monogamy as a journey, stemming from the fact that one is constantly learning from experience, ongoing, changing, on the move, forthcoming. This aspect was central to Vera's narrative. Next. So she said that poly polytomy is a pathway for self-discovery things that otherwise would be very difficult to reach, and is always worth it. To get to know more about yourself, even if it hurts, that's always worth it. And so, yeah, it was a good choice, it was a good thing, it is a good thing. This feeling is described also by Barker and Landridge as follows. Um, I think I've got a quote, I do. Yeah, next. No, I don't. Back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, no worry. So, no. So, they said, appreciation of the ever-shifting and changing nature of relationships, a commitment to flexible boundaries over rigid borders, coupled with an understanding that just because, because one can go anywhere, one does not have to go everywhere. Finally, despite um, a fragile asset of political and legal claims, through their daily practices of queer partnering, non-monogamous people are making a powerful contribution to rethinking citizenship, care and choice. Relationally diverse people can be seen as border figures to the extent that they may resist against advancing major legal claims, but their accounts of personal experiences are nevertheless highly political in their outcomes. In this regard, it is useful to remind Barker and Landridge when they pose the crucial question of whether people need to be aware that they are doing something radical and challenging to the dominant ideology in order to be understood as participating in radical ways of living, end of quote. So moving to the conclusion. A recent piece published by The Guardian started as follows. Low incomes coupled with rising living costs, debt and a lack of employment mean that some of us are not only unlikely to fulfill our more inventive childhood fantasies, but will fail to meet even the ba ba basic milestones of adulthood. A full-time permanent job, a life partner, a home, a pension and earning enough every month to put something into a savings account. Here, Guardian readers share their experiences of missing milestones, and the article was called Five Markers of Adulthood Millennial, Millennial Have Had to Give Up On. In one single paragraph, several layers of what we strongly take issue with at Intimate Research are exposed. One of these layers is mononormativity, coupled, pun intended, with compulsory partnering. Why would we think of not having a life partner's failure if it was not for the invisible and questionable supreme mononormative script? Interviewed for the Intimate Project in 2015, Gabriela Moita, sexologist there, and the former president of the Portuguese Society of Clinical Sexology, uh, made an important remark. This idea that you can only truly love one person and that the rest is love through failure this is the idea with which we grow up since birth, the idea that there is only one true love. And we must have overturned this, we must destroy this idea by making people think, making people see the difference, and to experience the difference. In the old days, lesbians were considered sick, and before that, they were sinners or criminals. And this is all stemming from the way love is conceptually constructed. 
For the purposes of this paper, the analytical focus was on relational citizenship as both notion and practice, theory and politics, aspiration and experience. It seems important to consider the mutual implications of intimacy and citizenship, exploring the extent to which issues of partnering, parenting and friendship are important aspects of being and becoming recognized as citizens. Next. The absence of formal recognition of non-monogamy contributes to the narratives of intimate dissonance produced by participants in the study for whom polyamory uh, closet is still very hard to break. Despite the consensual character of their relational experiences, participants' accounts display a tendency towards polyamory remaining a secret shared only with a handful of people, and certainly not with co-workers or employers. In this context, the lack of formal and cultural acknowledgement of consensual non-monogamy generates an asymmetry between the normal intimate citizen, who the state is willing to acknowledge, and the dissident intimate citizen, the uncoupled, the non-parent, the uncohabitant or solo living, the non-monogamous, who remains, at best, an outsider. Therefore, full intimate citizenship, a notion advanced by Sasha Rosnil, remains a political and theoretical aspiration rather than an actuality. Arguably, polyamory offers the opportunity to rethink citizenship in light of the border figure, an intersectional intimate citizen always in the process of becoming, mostly defined by, by what she or he is not actively seeking to achieve recognition, whilst at the same time holding to the freedom of constructing themselves as they go along. <coughs> Challenging the mononormative script of partnering one at a time. A stranger in a territory of prescribed coupledom. The words of the Spanish novelist uh, Villa Matas echo in my head. He cannot feel better. He has finally achieved what he was looking for to start falling in, to the other side. He thanks himself for being where he is, in this geography of strangeness. And what could be queerer or braver than embracing such a non-rehearsed geography of strangeness in the realm of intimacy? So, thank you. Thank you, Ana Cristina. Uh, one at a time. Now we are going to listen to Pablo Perez Navarro. Um, <laughs> his presentation is entitled Beyond Inclusion, Relational Diversity in the Borders of Citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. And hello. I'm going to focus on the Spanish case and, and I'm going to focus also on legal issues mostly. Most, most of the major part of the presentation is about legal issues. Can we pass to the first one? So whatever it is that you are coming from, <clears throat> I am sure that it won't come as, a, come as a surprise that the Spanish legislation is a source of privilege for monogamous couples. Filiation problems aside, I know that one, uh, marriage enjoys important tax benefits when compared with single people or, for that matter, with any other form of relationship. For example, only married couples can perform a joint tax return. But economic privileges cover also the security provided by the economic regimes of marriage, the regulation of alimony pensions in cases of separation or divorce, access to survivor pensions, benefits when buying or selling a house, and the protection of inheritance rights. The Spanish labor law also includes multiple provisions for legally constituted couples, ranging from marriage, marriage leaves to protections of care-related needs in different situations, such as permits in case of the disease of a sibling, or reductions of working hours in order to care for a dependent partner, to name a few. Not to talk about the laws that regulate who is entitled to make crucial decisions when a given patient cannot. Not surprisingly, these kind of provisions, protections and benefits 
which are in the context of, of the US, for example, they have been counted up to more than 1,000 protections, and leave many people who may or not have any interest in the symbolic value of marriage to get married or to register as, the, as a de facto union. That is the case precisely of one of the interviewees of the study, Jackie, who is a psychosexual guy in his mid-twenties, who has recently started questioning his gender identity, although he still uses and feels comfortable with male pronouns. When Jackie and the woman he is married to, Kenya, decided to get married, they did so after experiencing the lack of legal protection in a moment of crisis. And as he explains, when his father died, it was very hard. Not only because of the obvious part that made it very hard, but because Kenny and me were not married, nor were the facto union, nor had regulated our situation with the state. She had to ask for holidays so she could take days off at, of, at work in order to assimilate what had happened, because she did not have a father as such. And in my father, well, she had someone with, with whom she had a relationship with a great mutual confidence. It was a terrible blow, and on top of that, to be told at work, you cannot take a single day off. Well, as a consequence, and in prevision of future situations, they, and however reluctantly, they got married. So in case anything happened, and I'm quoting Jackie again, in our family lives, we could have enough time to accept it and to be together to share the pain and overcome it together. When I interviewed Jackie, he and Kenya were waiting for their first child and maintaining a long-term relationship with a third partner in what Jackie describes as a one plus one plus one horizontal trial. As it was the case with the relationship between him and Kenya, Jackie stressed during the interview the importance of a complex set of practices of mutual care between the different members of the trial. However, in this and in, in similar cases, the exclusionary effects of the lack of legal recognition are obvious. The law does not provide any formula whatsoever for including new members as part, as part of a relationship in order to protect these care practices between all of them. There are not days off or any other care-related provision for the third member of the trial. The position of the partners who lack the legal recognition that other members of the relationship are entitled to is in fact a very particular one. They are radically excluded from the set of rights and benefits eventually enjoyed only in a monogamously, mono, monogamously reciprocal way by his or, his or her own partners, hence reproducing the legal gap between privileged monogamous first-class citizens and non-monogamous second-class ones within non-monogamous relationships. Not surprisingly, this exclusionary character of marriage-like institutions alone turns them into an unacceptable option for many, for political reasons. This is, for the most part, the position of Alex, who is raising two kids with her 10 years long partner, Magdalena. Both of them have had simultaneous relationships in the past, but only Magdalena was maintaining a stable one with another guy at the moment of the interview, although it is common for Alex to share moments of sexual intimacy with his, with his girlfriend's boyfriend. For Magdalena, her queer feminist political convictions are sufficient reason for not joining the privileged side of relational diversity. By contrast, economic precariousness nuances Alex's position. His catalyst for considering getting married in spite of his anarchist, anarchist repulse for the way the state gets into your own bed is not the acquisition of care-related rights, as in Jackie's case, but a strictly economic line of reasoning. In Alex's words, we are not married. We have thought about it because of the kids. I would do it for the papers. That is the only reason for which I would marry. I mean, I would not organize any party. 
we do have talked about organizing a party because of the 10 years we have spent together, but of course I would not celebrate a wedding. Nonetheless, I would consider it because in, any, in case any of us dies, I mean, we are two quite precarious people with salaries below 1,000 euros. If any of us dies, we would be bad naked. I want us to have a survivor's pension up to maybe 200 or 300 euros that can provide some support. Counting on this kind of economic protection can indeed be a way of ameliorating the anxiety of a precariousness, as the politic theorist Isabel Lorry terms it. As Alex says, argument exemplifies precariousness is currently one um, sorry, precariousness is currently one of the social forces that pressures the most for complying with the terms of monogamous marriage-like institutions. Very especially so in those southern European countries that have been more affected by austerity politics and the regimes of debt, such as Spain. To get an idea of the contrast with other contexts where poly communities tend to have a middle or even an upper class status, it may be useful to say that all of the other interviewees' monthly income was also under 100 euros per month, and most of them were experiencing or had experienced in the recent past long periods of unemployment, economic migration, and labor exploitation. That being the case, and now that polyamory has become the new black in Brigitte Vasallo's ironic words, and at the same time that precariousness has also become the new black, it is probably not too bold to assume that legal struggles demanding different forms of state protection for non-monogamous relations are going to become increasingly common. So far, the only examples of struggles for the recognition of non-monogamous uh, relationships have come from polygamous families. Court's general tendency is clear to deny any request of nationality, of family reunions, of widows' pensions coming from polygamous families on the basis that polygamy, due to its inherent gender imbalance, sickens the Spanish public order. You can see the actual words from a, from a sentence, a recent one. Uh, this concept of public order uh, appears, in fact, in most court rulings regarding polygamous families. In, a, in its strictly legal sense, it is linked with such vague concepts as the general order of society and even to the set of principles and fundamental values of a community tending to achieve society's common good. Therefore, when we consider the impact that of these court rulings on the constitution of society as a whole, it becomes clear that a certain secularity is involved, because rather than simply, apply, simply being simply applying a technical concept, these court rulings would in fact be performatively producing the very same result that is said to ground these legal decisions. That is, the strictly monogamous character of a society that maintains certain forms of non-monogamy, such as polygamy, as its aberrant other. It is very plausible that in the near future, the courts reject similar claims made by non-polygamous, but still non-monogamous either people, in the name of similar arguments, perhaps nuanced by the absence of formal, and I would emphasize the word formal here, gender imbalances, as it is the case of poly relationships, but very possibly still adults with most judges' interpretation of the general order of society. In fact, diverse as they are, it may be the case that the only justifiable one of all possible polyphobias is that of the judges and policy makers, because given its legislative but also metajudicial implications, it is fair to say that monogamy is so entrenched in the Spanish legislation that dealing with non-monogamies is not only like dealing with the other of, non of monogamy, but with that of the legislation itself. Mm, I think it is precisely there where some of the most promising and disruptive possibilities opened up by non-monogamies rely in the way it forces us to reconceive 
the relation between the state and the realm of intimate relational practices. The encounter between non-monogamies and the law, I think that it requires to finally find an answer to the question posed by queer theorist Michael Warner in 1999. What kind of marriage are we talking about? And, and, and how might its place in the context of state regulations about sexuality be changed? Needless to say, the mere recognition of plural marriages would be a very, very poor answer to Warner's question. Instead, as Lisa Dugan and others have asked, a much more flexible menu of options would be needed to even start dealing with the most basic forms of relational diversity in the field of non-monogamies. Thanks to their pretty much intractable diversity, non-monogamies represent an opportunity to understand that gay and lesbian marriages were just a totally illusory promise of full inclusion for all. We have to be fast in overcoming this end-of-the-road feeling <clears throat> that equal marriage, equal marriage laws are bringing to us. Um, furthermore, it may, be that, it may be the case that only by thinking beyond the narrative of pro progressive inclusion of successive groups within existing institutions, rather than by finding alternatives to them, can we start questioning the privilege-driven logic of the relation between the state and the intimate field. But I think that we would be still be missing at least one fundamental question were we to reduce the struggle for the recognition of relational diversity to a merely mercantilist uh, proliferation of possible legal contracts between free citizens, one which implies acknowledging the role of normative relational models in deciding who counts as a citizen in the first place. Before concluding, let me illustrate this point with a scene described by another interviewee named Daniel. Uh, Don San was one of Daniel's long-term relationships. He is from South Korea, used to live in Paris, and had married a French woman in what is commonly referred to as a, as a marriage of convenience, in order to be allowed to remain in Europe. He stayed at his wife's house for some time to protect themselves from an eventual investigation by the immigration police. It was common for Daniel to spend some nights with Dan San at his wife's house. One of those nights, at the late hour, they all startled. We were together in this double bed, and his wife slept in another bed in her own room. At a certain point, we were, we were almost naked when suddenly someone energetically knocked on the door, and we thought it was the police. How were we going to justify their marriage when he and I were in the same bed? I really freaked out. I was already thinking, where am I going to hide? Fortunately, especially for Don Sam, it was not the police who was knocking on the door, it was just the neighbor. Nonetheless, drawing on this imaginary knocking, I would like to call the attention for a second in the way a non-monogamous and not even heterosexual migrant had, had to comply, even if fraudulently so, with the terms of recognition offered by the heterosexual at the time in France and a strictly monogamous institution of marriage. The fact that that was the easiest way for him to obtain a residence permit, maybe the only one, greatly stresses some of the often ignored relations between compulsory heterosexuality and or compulsory monogamy and certain forms of state violence, such as the threat or the actual reality of forced deportation. Moreover, in the hypothetical case that their marriage had been legit and that they were nonetheless sleeping as they were, that there would be have still uh, good reasons for being scared. The immigration police would have been equally very interested in the number of, and the distribution of people in the rooms and beds of the house. Disclosing a non-monogamous relationship between the three of them would have probably not been a very, very wise idea. One can, one can hardly imagine a better way of picturing the underlying threat of violence in this insistence of the state in getting into your own bed, in Alex's words, than this imaginary knocking of the police at the door of Dunstan's wife. 
house in relation with a particular form of political asylum that marriage represents for many, this imaginary knocking also stresses the extent to which the borders of citizenship are monogamously constituted, turning mononormativity, among other systems of relational normativity, in an all too often neglected source of state violence. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, now moving from Spain to Italy, we are going to listen to Beatrice Guzmano uh, with the paper The Kintsugi Art of Care and Reveling Consent in Ethical Non-Monogamies. Good afternoon. Um, um, I will start by the theoretical framework of my presentation since uh, concerning the topic of ethical non-monogamies in Italy, there are discourses that are starting to deconstruct the heteronormative and mononormative framework in order to resignify intimate relationships uh, in a context of an increasing economic precariousness. This work is a contribution to the sociology of intimacy defined by Plummer as, and I quote, the ways in which all aspects of intimacy involve doing things together, doing gender, doing sex, doing relationships, doing bodies. For the purpose of, the, of this presentation, since Plummer's definition of intimacy involves only bodies, feelings, identities, relationships and interactions, I would add the concept of care that I will develop along this talk. The fieldwork was conducted in Rome during spring 2015 and it took into consideration two aspects. The activist discourses on ethical non-monogamies in Italy, developed by two communities that deal with polyamory, that are polyamore and rifacciamo l'amore Italia, that are more that are that define themselves as support groups, communities and by a network of trans, feminist and queer collectives, the Su Movimento Nazionale, that Alessia was talking about it this morning. And uh, this national network is challenging romantic and monogamous love, discussing its oppressive and policing role in present society. This collective knowledge uh, was analyzed through the analysis of three websites, through the results of seven, seven semi-structured interviews, with activists, activists and through participant observation in events and meetings. Moreover, I gather narratives on ethical non-monogamies by five able, economically precarious, white, Italian, LGBTQ people, aged 27 35, living in Rome. In their discovering of the normative oppression of monogamy, these interviewees have uh, have all in common the fact of valuing, valuing their, their collective dimension, their belonging to um, sex-positive support groups or to queer activism. And in so doing, they challenge the individualistic turn proposed by mainstream self-help books on polyamory, focusing only on free personal choice and agency. For the purpose of this presentation, I will focus just on biographical data. Getting to the aim of my presentation, today I want to question the fact that polyamory requires the consent of all the people involved, proposing to move the focus from consent to care. According to its standard definition and widespread definition as well, polyamory is defined by Franklin Vox as the state or practice of maintaining multiple sexual and or romantic relationships simultaneously with the full knowledge and consent of all the people involved. While consent is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as permission for something to happen or agreement to do something, therefore defining borders and borders are always normative. In the words of Jameson, Care means to watch over, look after, or assist in practical ways, as well as to feel attachment and fondness. 
while the common definition of consent is to give pe permission beforehand, care takes place not only before, but also during and after things have occurred through the practices of attentiveness, that means caring about, that is also noticing the needs of others, responsibility, that means taking care of, competence, that is caregiving, and that I will, anal I will analyze the concept of competence uh, through, through the, let's say, the competence of communication, Responsiveness, that means care receiving, which comprises also uh, the awareness of one's own vulnerabilities. And trust, that is defined as the oil in the wheel of care. And it merged, it merged in my interviews as the oil of ethical non-monogamous relationships as well. When presenting the empirical material, I go through the, these four concepts and then we skip the concept of trust because it is deemed as the starting point of non-monogamous, ethical non-monogamous relationships. In order to move the focus from consent to care, I use the powerful metaphor of Kintsuji, the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with a mix of golden powder. This technique comes from a philosophy that considers uh, uh, breakage and its subsequent uh, reparation as part of the object history, as something to be proud of. Therefore, I define the Kintsushi art of care as a practice that comprises the complexity of doing intimacy, trying to be a, being aware of our own limits, of other people's vulnerabilities, where the uh, as well, where the, other, the golden power represented the multifaceted matrix of care composed by caregiving, care receiving, and self care. In order to challenge the centrality of consent, I will analyze the case study of Morgana, a self defined bisexual woman cohabitating with Alberto, a, a six year long relationship, and having a love story with Marta for the last two years, none of her partners self-define as poly. She talks about two episodes that were not foreseen in her relationships. The first one was falling in love uh, uh, with a woman, and the second one was having a sexual encounter with a man. Morgana was used, was used to have only sexual encounters and not love uh, relationships, only with women and not with men. <coughs> When she fell in love with Marta, she described it as having been totally unprepared. Uh, she started to change her daily routine in order to accommodate her time with Marta, while Alberto, according to Morgana's narrative, had to deal with the change. When deciding about having a sexual encounter with a man, Morgana was aware that she was at a crossroads between what she wanted and what her partners would have preferred. She felt trapped, waiting for a change that had to come from her partners, as we can read in the first citation. If you don't understand deeply what you want, then you are going to feel uncomfortable in that situation, so you are somehow undermining it. Uh, she decided to do, uh, to do it anyhow, finding Alberto, Alberto's admiration, and, she, and Alberto said, I admire you because somehow you don't go against yourself, against what you really want, even it mean, if it means to, to challenge what you have and love. Therefore, consent is better understood as a blurred concept. It is more likely that people try to push the boundaries of negotiations instead of waiting for the green light. Consent is not black or white. Thus, an honest communication is one of the best strategies found by interviewees to cope with different desires and wishes. More than getting consent, the aim is to make partners aware of what is going on. Communication is a process that works better if it is transparent since the beginning of the relationship. In these quotes, I refer to the narrative of Bruno, a PhD student in humanities, self-defined as faggot and queer. He has a long-distance relationship with a Latino guy living abroad who has four relationships. 
In the first excerpt, Bruno reports what Miguel told him about his other relationships. Miguel avoided to create hierarchies between partners in, in, in order to make him feel more comfortable. And Miguel said, I don't want to measure on a scale all my relationships and see which one weighs more, which one less, only to make you feel better and more important. I just tell you that I have these relationships. So if you want to be with me and if you're ready to deal with it, you need to know that they exist. Um, Miguel prefers to anticipate Bruno's expectation of exclusivity, being clear about the importance of every relationship he is into. Therefore, therefore, Bruno has the possibility of deciding whether or not he wants to stay in that constellation without building fantasies of primacy that could never be met by Miguel, therefore feeling at ease with him. And Bruno says, being clear, that's it, with no mis misunderstandings. He told me this because if he hadn't, I would probably have reproduced the model of my previous relationships. Since care is an ongoing practice, it is necessary to understand how to take care one of each other, assuming responsibilities, and admitting also moments of rupture that are deemed important in order to fix things up. The metaphor of Kintsuji came to my mind when I listened to the account of Nadia, a self-defined pansexual woman. And Nadia said, Polyamory gave me double, triple, 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 triple responsibility because you have many sensibilities in your hands and also you make a lot of mistakes and sometimes you feel like you're in a glass store and you're breaking everything but then everything can be fixed, everything can be okay, you rebuilt it and what was broken because becomes even stronger. Responsibility comes along with attentiveness, that is, noticing the needs of other people. Attentiveness, though, has limits, because other, other people's needs cannot prevaricate personal, lim personal needs, as clearly explained by Nicoletta, a self-defined queer, lesbian and feminist activist who has a two-year-long relationship with Anna and a starting relationship with another woman. In this excerpt, when talking about consent and compromise, Nicoletta states, I've always hated the concept of compromise within relationships because it means that you are giving up a part of yourself and it means that somebody is not doing what they feel like doing. And so yeah, it auto automatically creates discomfort in the relationship. People always tell me that I am being selfish if doing what I decide and what I feel means to be selfish, then either we redefine this word or fine, I accept it, simple as it is. Okay. Care is a process in which borders between caregiver and care receiver are, blur are, are blurred. A process in which one's own vulnerabilities are unveiled as well. The first excerpt comes from the narrative of Rudy, a self-defined gay trans man actually living with Christian, his 10-year-long relationships, and Christian's girlfriend, Roberta. Talking about one of his first poly experiences, Rudy says, I instinctively understood that jealousy was arising, but this was because I had some sort of emptiness inside, and so I started to carve out some, sp some space for myself to do things I liked. It was a, sor a sort of rebirth. Mm -hmm. Some of these vulnerabilities are, are also the result of uh, socialization imprinted to monogamy. And in this process of self-awareness, when jealousies or strives to control are surfacing, interviewees often understand that those emotions that Bruno called the, the monsters inside me are talking about one's own self-balance, about how much one is able to manage their emotions without letting them become partners' responsibility, as Nicoletta explains in the second quote. That night, I got really jealous. 
I felt so humiliated. Afterwards, I felt so humiliated by my own reaction. I was locking myself up in feelings that were so useless to my relationship with myself and with others. You have to learn to experience emotions against which you constantly fight, like possession, jealousy, control. It is hard work. I mean, every day you wake up and you must be self-balanced. Responsiveness is a way of taking care of one's own emotions, a way of taking responsibilities for them. And it is also a way to turn relationships cleaner and lighter from emotions that have more to do with one's own vulnerabilities than, than with the relationship itself. Okay. So getting to conclusions, care is a central feature in ethical non-monogamous relationships and it goes way beyond consent. It is precisely what the metaphor of Kintsushi conveys, and it is well described by the song of Leonard Cohen, Huntem, when he says, there is a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. So consent operates in a fictional linear dimension without taking into account unexpected events, new relationship energy, vulnerabilities, desires, and crossroads. That is precisely the raw material of intimacies from which arises the art of care, a creative practice shaped in contingent ways by what one has attained. Moreover, while consent usually affects a limited number of people, usually two, who make an agreement, care can radiate all over because it is not bound to a specific situation. It's a way of being in the world, of carrying them out, of assuming responsibilities, of admitting vulnerabilities. Furthermore, by giving a great value to their non-normative communities in shaping the way they do intimacies, interviewees have come up with an effective antidote to isolation and individualization. Understood in this sense, care assumes an overwhelming power that puts caregivers and care receivers at the same level, giving both the responsibility of taking care not only of each other, but of themselves as well, thus working off shadows of victimization. And I will conclude with the snapshot of Georg's video, Unravel, that was so inspiring in finding the title for this presentation. So, thank you for your attention.